Hi, I'm Len Epp from Lean Pub, and in this episode of the Front Matter Podcast, I'll be interviewing Helene Gidley. Based in Ann Arbor, Helene is an accomplished Agile trainer, mentor, and coach who has worked with many organizations to optimize their Agile practices. For over 30 years, she has worked with a wide range of professionals from Fortune 500 companies, startups, and mid-sized organizations. You can follow her on Twitter X at HS Gidley and check out her website at hsgconsultingllc.com. Helene is the author of the Lean Pub book, The Art of Agile Living, a simple and powerful approach to tame your overwhelm. Helene's book is not about managing tasks. It's about embracing a new way of thinking and living, about regaining focus, and about adopting a daily ritual that brings structure, clarity, and meaning to your day, allowing you to achieve more and reduce the overwhelm that so often plagues our modern existence. In this interview, we're going to talk about Helene's background and career, professional interests, her book, and at the end, we'll talk a little bit about her experience as an author. So thank you very much, Helene, for being on the Lean Pub Front Matter podcast. I'm thrilled to be here, and thank you for, for having me and uh, giving me a chance to uh, say a few things, um, b- both about myself and the book. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. Um, I always like to start these interviews by asking people for their origin story. Um, mm-hmm. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about where you grew up and how you found your way into a career in Agile you know, consulting. Um, sure, I'd love to. Um, and I was thinking about this the other day, and I'll, I will... Uh, kind of go back to where I grew up, which is New Jersey. And um, uh, my career in IT kind of happened really almost by happenstance. Uh, It was my senior year of high school where I was introduced to this entirely new profession. Um, I'm going to be showing a little bit of my um, maturity because my high school did not have any exposure to computer science at the time. We're talking the early 1970s. And I had been on a trajectory basically to be a secretary and taking all the requisite typing and shorthand courses. And it was my senior year that I was asked if I could help out Marsha in the data processing room during my study halls and free time. She needed someone to help out while she was in training using some new IBM system based on floppy disks. Not knowing what any of this was precisely, (laughs) and having really nothing better to do, I said, sure. Um, So I enter this room that I didn't even know existed before. It was through the truant officer's office. That was a bit intimidating since I had had an opportunity to interact with the truant officer in the past. (laughs) So slinking past her desk... (laughs) I opened the door to Marsha's data processing room and was just met with a cacophony of sights and sounds. A large machine to my left was like cut chunking away, spitting out this continuous feed of green and white striped paper. A long, low machine to my right was whirring with hundreds of like rectangular objects, cards, flipping through them through little chutes. Marsha was off to the side, plugging in colored wires into what looked like a spaghetti of wires on a board. I was enthralled. I was hooked. I now knew what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. And that was the beginning, right? This was, for those following along, that's unit record equipment. This is, you know, dealing with punched cards. And yeah, the floppy disks were the, the new thing at the time. And that's just where I started. So it was playing catch up for college admission um, and community college to the rescue on that one. Um, and that really started my career. So we're talking now, you know, mid 70s, and there aren't a lot of programmers out there. It was a very um, lucrative time in the industry to be finding a job. And companies were hiring anybody with experience, even out of community college. Um, to to work in their large organization. So I got a job after a two-year college um, associate's degree working for Exxon Corporation. Um, yeah, with their, one of their uh, corporate headquarters in uh, New Jersey. And you know, I, I started on like a support role training engineers on how to use the IBM mainframe computer, which by now I now knew what all of those terms meant. <laughs> and I moved on from there to doing systems programming to, you know, where systems programmers maintain and update the software on the mainframe. 
and to, to doing some of the first web programming and to management and project management. Um, so that's kind of my origination of how did I wind up in that field? And it truly was that, that happenstance um, um, opportunity um, that we so often are, are, don't recognize that we're given, but these, these little gifts over, over time. That's yeah. such a that's such a wonderful wonderful story and a very evocative kind of image of walking through that doorway into that room and something completely unexpected there that just you know cap- captivated you right away. Um, yeah. One thing that uh, because so many of the guests on our podcast over time have been sort of people who've been in the technology world, the the it, story of their first encounter with a computer um, mm-hmm. is actually kind of a very uh, uh, you know interesting kind of time capsule, I guess, for each person's life and. And yeah. but of our own technological history, I guess, and uh, right. and right. Uh, you know, for a lot of people, it's like, um, you know, the a parent brings a computer home from work or something like that. But I have, but there have been lots of guests too where it's like like that, where they're in some institution like a university or a school or something like that, and that's where they get they get introduced to it, and it's uh, just a curious thing where like you reflect on like, you know, nowadays, you know, computers are just a kind of they're no more remarkable than toasters. To people kind of born <laughs> born now yeah. they're, just, they're just a machine in the in the in the world unlike any other um mm-hmm. but i think there is a sort of sense of magic that can that the those of us who are a little bit uh, more have a little bit perhaps more maturity <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, uh can can experience and that you know yeah. not to, not to digress but an interesting thing about that kind of magic is that for like a lot of people who for every person who finds it magical in a positive sense there are people who find it magical in a kind of superstitious and kind of like scary sense as well. Mm-hmm. They're like, what are these scary machines that are doing these things to us all the time? This invisible work around us and people for whom, and like, you know, it's a bit, it's a bit uh, loaded of an example, but the kind of person who would have never batted an eye at a phone book uh, mm-hmm. displaying their, having their personal data on it. Uh, but if they, but if, a, if they find out like a computer does, they're like, oh, you know, I want my personal data back or something like that. But uh, I, yeah, that's very true. But you know, that physical world of you know, in your example, the phone book was still somewhat limited, right? It was limited to an area around you, so you could kind of feel like these were your neighbors, right? It was your home community. Your and phone books uh, were often literally, um, uh, boy, towns and uh, townships uh, nearby. So it wasn't even your entire state. If you wanted a phone number for someone out outside of your immediate area, you had to go to another phone book to get that. Right. So you know, I get it <laughs> um, that, but the phone book was was okay. But you know, having it out on the internet, which is now worldwide, is you know a whole different feeling for for people. Yeah, um, it's, al- it's also it is yeah. intimidating. It is, it is, and then the machines. That's why I said it was a kind of loaded example because then machines can do all kinds of automated things with it and 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 stuff like that, which is something to be aware of um right but uh yeah it's uh, and so um what this leads me just before we move on to talk about how you got into agile and stuff like that because you did mention at the end they're getting into management work and things like that um if you were starting out now in 2023 Mm -hmm. with all the resources available to us um, outside community college or university or what have Mm -hmm. you would you with the intention of going into kind of technology and programming and stuff like that if you had that intention now and you were starting Mm -hmm. out would you do a, a college degree or would you, as it were, just learn on your own? That's a great question. Um, and because I, I kind of did a little of both, right? I had that two-year college degree and then spent a lot of time learning on my own. Um, but my own personal experience did teach me that that four-year degree mattered, that there really is a ceiling for those who don't have the certifications behind their 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 knowledge and their experience. Um, and I did eventually get a four-year bachelor's degree that enabled me to finally, and, and it was proven as soon as I got that bachelor's degree, oh, then I was promoted to a manager. Prior to that, I, I was limited. So, and I, and I think with so many people graduating college these days, and college is now becoming far more the norm for people, I 
I would start right with college. Yes. And maybe still with the community college, depending on your, your funds and your availability. I had a great start um, with a community college and then I could transfer into the four year school for, you know, the, the final two years. Um, but I would just be what I see in industry, right? And maybe it depends where you want to go, but if you want the large corporations, that kind of stability you get with, with the large companies, they like that certification behind your name. You know, they like knowing that you have that four-year degree, you have some some history behind that, and they like certifications on top of it. Um, you know, if you whether it's certifications in programming um, or in project management or in some management skills, large companies like that. Um, there's many of us that might feel that doesn't really mean you know it. It doesn't really mean that that you are um, the, the perfect person for that job, but it means you have a common vocabulary, right? And you have exposure to things that the companies you know may may be using tools that they may be using and practices that they want to follow, and that's I think a big part of what they look for in in the degrees and certifications. I think that's a really great answer, um, uh, particularly the part at the end there really resonated with me where you talk about the common language. Um, people can people can kind of take that too far and load that idea with too much sometimes. But, mm. um, you know, I remember uh, uh, talking to a young, a young program, who happened to be a programmer one day, who was saying like, what's the point of taking all of these courses? And he was in university that, you know, mm-hmm. aren't, aren't about programming. And I said, well, you know, for example, like if you're having a conversation with someone about anything and there's two people involved or, or, and you are one person involved and you're trying to strategize or understand around their strengths and weaknesses. And you say, you know, he's more like a Hamlet than a Macbeth. Mm-hmm. If you've both read those plays, you've just sort of delivered a hundred hours worth of information yeah. to people. And, you know, that kind of, that, and then that's just an example from literature and stuff like that. But like, you know, those, that kind of shared language really is a kind of key to a kind of the kind of collaboration that's possible. Um, that being said, you know, of course, you can achieve all those things without going to university, like t- specifically going to university yeah. uh, and, and getting the, getting the degree and stuff like that. But also, you know, what you said about, you know, the big, more or less the sort of more institutional, the institution that you're mm-hmm. working for. The more Mm -hmm. they'll have, they'll whether they whether the people doing the hiring or the promoting believe in it themselves or not, they just have processes. And if those processes mean you have to hire someone with a university degree, then you just have to hire someone with a university degree, and and that's that. Um, There, there are you know fewer places that will uh, reject you because you have one (laughs) than there are that will accept you because because you do. Uh, exactly. Uh, exactly. And so, you know, it's if you can afford it and you have the time and money, then it's a it's a sort of decent decent um, bet uh, on future career. Um, to, but so speaking of that, so you studied uh, at community college, learned programming, then you did a four year degree in com- computer programming and things like that. But you eventually mm-hmm. made your way into management. And what was your first experience, I guess, with like being responsible for introducing an agile process to a team? Oh, a wonderful question. Um, one that I, I love to reflect on. Um, somewhere in about 2001 is about when I had been exposed to Agile in the first place. I was taking a training class at a company here in town in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and um, they were teaching some basic practices of, of Agile. And I, I tried... I, was absorbing it a little bit at the time, but it was a few years later that I became a little more enmeshed in it. I wound up working for that firm um, here in, in Michigan. And their version of Agile was a very tactile um, approach where you're really engaged with it, with your teams. And as I moved on to other companies, so we're kind of you know early, mid 2000s, I actually brought those techniques with me. Um, so even though I'm at a large company, um, again, corporate America, where they have their own ways of doing things. It's a very traditional approach. I came in with different tactile approaches, and one was a planning approach for team members. So I'm a project manager at this point, um, been tasked with, with creating project plans and, and you know helping uh, teams complete their, their tasks to get a project done in something like a year, a year to 18 months. 
uh, on these <clears throat> usually long running projects. And the typical project management approach is like you might ask people what their tasks are, but you lay out the plan and then they have to follow it. And I turned it on its head entirely and said, OK, we're going to have you create what are the tasks that you need to do to, to finish this project. And this particular one, we were um, combining multiple libraries and systems into one. And we were doing some, <clears throat> some consolidation. And I was working with teams and I, I brought literally these 11 by 17 physical planning sheets, paper, and other sheets of paper smaller that they could write on and say, okay, here's what we're going to do. This sheet would represent like a week's worth of work for you, for you know one individual. Let's take your work and start to break it down into some slightly smaller pieces that would fit into a week. Then you could plan them out over numerous weeks. And let's just go create create your project plan. And I was surprised and pleasantly surprised at how well that worked. Um, early on, they had very big tasks. They, they set their sights on something rather large. But we came back to this at every, oh, maybe every monthly meeting, we'd get together in person again and go through these planning sheets. And they would modify it. And as we the time ticked on, they really took it to heart and started to get things smaller and started to accomplish things in that smaller chunk of time. And I was pleased at how well it was working because in the end, it was their plan. They were managing it and they had a different set of tools, but they owned it. And that's what you were really after. You know, it's, if you don't want to be telling someone else what they need to do or it's like your version of their plan. You want it to be theirs and you want them to feel that they totally own it and can modify it. So that was my first exposure of bringing something a little different into a very traditional environment, still kind of fitting it in. It's, we still had plans and we had some of the other terms and, and um, uh, deliverables that the organization looks for, um, and charts and PERT charts and project plans written out in Microsoft Project. But um, I was able to uh, and give people something that they could own a little bit more. And yes, it was successful. You know, we were able to accomplish what we needed to and the time we were looking at. Um, and all the, the better was the team had grown together because now they were working with one another on their dependencies and their, their um, points where they had to overlap and work together. And I just found it was a, a far better approach so um, that was just one of my first examples of taking something that was very radically different and then bringing it to, you know, teams. And they now in, they would enjoy my showing up at meetings with these big sheets of paper and then the smaller sheets and lots of pens and things to write on. And, OK, we're going to do this again. And they're like, OK, here comes Aline with her paper. I was going to ask you about that. So you mentioned um, tactility there, and sorry if I, yeah, if I sort of missed missed a detail, but it's 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 very interesting. I mean, like sort of, I didn't know the story about the kind of like the machine going ka chunk ka chunk and the paper moving through it and stuff like right. that. That that tactility, like being present with something that you can touch and hold and see yeah. and kind of manipulate to some extent with your hands, um, yeah. seems to be a very important part of, of of what what sort of you what 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 attracts you to these these processes and um, and so. It's it's very interesting. So you said people would have these like charts, like Gantt charts or PERT charts or things like that that are yeah. being probably generated by people typing on computers and things like that. But then mm -hmm. you'd show up with your paper. So what yeah. I'm sort of really curious, what were people doing? Like would they would a team of you sit at a big long table and like start from left to right and like write down what the tasks were and draw lines to dependencies or what what was it what was it actually what form did it pretty much and it would be generally and and most projects, you had um, smaller teams that were overlapping with one another. You might have one team that was working on having to move the data from one library system to another. You might have someone else that needs to set up the configurations of the library systems, right? So you had kind of different skills. So those were the people that would I would pair them together. It's like, you guys need to work with each other on how you're going to get the data out of your old library systems and into the new one. Some other folks are going to be working out how they're going to, you know, map some of the data and they have to coordinate with the folks getting the data. So, you know, maybe the four of you are going to talk. So it would be a combination of 
at one big table, but I usually broke people into groups. So they were doing teamwork together in small, multiple small teams as they were indeed just writing things out kind of left to right, or just I would have them write them on um, small um, eight by 10 pa paper, and we would start cutting them into smaller chunks. Like, oh, if it's a full week, that's a full eight by 10 sheet of paper. Oh, but if it's a half a week, then that's a half a sheet of paper. If it's a, you know, less than that, you know, that let's get it on a smaller sheet. And that's how they were writing things out and beginning to physically place them onto the big planning sheets. One and question. Mm -hmm. One question I always like to ask people. So it sounds like in this situation, you had a kind of internal, you were part of a company, you had an internal mandate to go in and help, you know, a team sort of adopt a new practice and stuff like that. But one, one question I always like to ask people who have, you know, ad, been agile consultants, maybe gone independent and, you know, done their, done, done, found, found their own clients and things like that. If you're brought into like a team that's hostile to an agile transformation, or where like maybe the team's desperate for it, but don't dare say it because they know their manager is against it. How do you go about sort of convincing people, you know, they might feel like, oh, like, you know, now I'm, this doesn't just doesn't seem very professional. Like, you know, you were talking about sitting down and writing things down on paper when what we have all these wonderful computers and all these apps. And maybe there was like, you know, a big agile enterprise sale or sorry, a big enterprise sale where some executives mm -hmm. spent millions of dollars on licenses for software. And now you're like, uh, you know, moving on from paper and pen to like post-it notes and things like that. And you're like, this is actually a better technology. Uh, post-it notes in a wall, yeah. <laughs> you know, might be a yeah. better technology than some of this other stuff. Just just in general, like how have you approached resistance or hostility to this kind of change? You have to meet people where they are, right? And so if they're resistant, if they're hostile to it, then it is not the right time or the right place to be introducing something different. Um, it's, I've had success when I'm brought into organizations because I, I have done that consulting work and, um, been brought in to bring agile into a, an organization where perhaps the management is, is happy, is, is, um, supportive of it. And the team members are the ones that are a bit skeptical. So that's where we, we tread slowly, maybe not in a way with all the big planning sheets and paper, but we'll, we'll institute a couple of things slower. Um, maybe breaking work down into smaller chunks using their online software. And maybe we'll introduce, you know, daily quick stand-up meetings to review, you know, where what you're working on and areas where you could use some assistance from others. You know, finding ways to bring that collaboration and some of these more agile approaches uh, to the to the team members. So I would start slowly. Um, if the whole place was um, resistant to it, then then I'm not being brought in as the agile coach and consultant. I'm probably just being brought in as a project manager. And they want the traditional stuff, and that's what they would get. So right. it, it's really, you, you, it doesn't work well to try to convince others if they're really that resistant. So yeah, it, that's really fascinating. But you know, even even if there's some resistance, they're sort of modifying oh, yeah. processes and tools, the way they use mm -hmm. the tools that they already have instead of just clobbering with the Monty Python foot or what have you. That's, that's a joke. <laughs> oh. I exactly. And and that's the, the the heart of what my my process is, the art of agile living is to really break work down into smaller chunks. You know, so I wanted to talk about that that thank you. You did the great podcast guest uh, uh gift of the Fantastic segue to talk about your book, <laughs> The Art of Agile Living. Yeah. But that's actually the thing I was, when I was preparing for this interview, I was really thinking about it. It's so fascinating that, you know, to take something that comes from the world of like high industry and, you know, manufacturing and, I mean, programming and, and things like that, where you're working with teams of people who might be communicating with each other from all over the world, working on either like very, like the challenge of very old technology or the challenge of very new technology. And then taking this very sophisticated thing and applying it to your, one's daily life. Um, exactly, exactly. And it was really from these, um, those times when I was working with teams and planning entire projects out on paper. And in many cases, yes, that paper would wind up in a computerized tool, right? You know, it, not everybody was working at the same site. And, you know, if we might do all of our planning 
in one location. We all did a, a um, business meeting, flying into one location, do our planning, and then we're all back off to our other offices. So I often spent time moving things back into the computerized uh, systems. Um, so, you know, it, there, there's a way to, to um, work with both, but I found that the 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 art of breaking work into smaller chunks was really the the success story um, because when you can have smaller pieces of work, you get things done faster, right? Because it's smaller, right? I've I've taken this really large project and I've broken it down into something really tiny, and or lots of tiny bits, and I now start delivering things um, faster, right? I see things getting done. I, I see bits of things getting done. I can get feedback faster from from customers. And um, if my own work, I get feedback back on, oh, I've completed something, a, a task. Oh, I was working um, on creating a forum for the book. And I'm just using a Wix tool. And I'm, I'm not really great at Wix. So I'm always a little nervous getting in there. And so my task was something small of create a post. Okay, I did. And I immediately, you know, can get feedback not only um, for myself of like, oh, that was a lot easier than I thought it would be. And now I can get feedback from others as they can see the post and start interacting with it. So you, you, it's that feedback cycle that is so valuable um, to getting work done because it gives you that sense of accomplishment that I am getting work done. I'm, I'm making a progress, momentum forward on what I'm working through and on. Um, and there's just something about our human condition that thrives on that kind of positive feedback. I wanted to talk to you about that because that's something you talk about in your in your videos and in, and in the book and things like that. Um, uh, your, uh, uh, Helene has videos on YouTube about the art of agile living. They're easy to find and they're, they're really good. Some of them are a little bit shorter. Some of them are a little bit longer, but they all mm-hmm. must be interesting to say. And one thing I really like about, which I actually just confess I don't do, but should is, you know, have more tactility in my sense of, of, of progress and accomplishment, right? So one of the things you write about in your book and you write this, people have lots of different approaches to these kinds of things. But one thing is like, just have a stack of like index cards that you've, you've, you've sort of maybe got, get, get by the big table, write out the sort of big project, you know, book, right? And then, well, yes. now that you've, now that you've got something there, well, what's right. a book? Well, I actually have to write a manuscript, Well, what am I going to write the manuscript in? How am I going to work with my co- who are my co-authors? What's the end goal? What's the platform I want to get it on? What you know, and like it can you can be like it, as you've talked about overwhelming uh, to sort of this thing, but but just sit there, take the time, break it down, and have this pile, and you can have a pile of cards, and then eventually in the end you could have like here's my book pile of cards. Oh my goodness, isn't it high? Uh, mm-hmm. But then you can take the one on top and be like, this is what I said I should do next, and it could be like you know edit chapter three, and you're like, you know what, I don't feel like editing chapter three. Take the next one. Create a book for them. Oh, that sounds interesting. Uh, you know, and then when, and when it's done, you can put the cart, and then you can sort of see your stack of like kind of things to do. Yes, getting smaller and smaller. I mean, it'll grow in its own way as you learn more. But then the, there's a stack that's getting done. Yes, and and just that feeling of like at the end of the day, like look, there's what I did. Can is is feedback of its own kind that like you've you've created it yourself. But that that sense of like there, that's what my day was. Uh, yeah. can just be really amazing. But I brought up the human condition for a specific reason that that's related to this, which is um, you talk about short-term memory when you talk about the doorway effect. Oh, yes. Uh, and it's it's interesting. So, you know, the end of the day can kind of be like that too when you quit work and it's kind of like you, it's like going through a doorway and maybe you're like, what did I actually do today? I don't remember. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, but so anyway, could you talk for a few minutes about what the, the very, very interesting doorway effect is? That was fascinating. Uh, when I first heard about this, Uh, the doorway effect. And that is every time you step through a doorway, you dump about 20% of your short-term memory. And you think about it, I mean, and and you know this happens when you're upstairs in a bedroom and you say, oh, I need to go get some scissors from the kitchen. And you walk down and you have to go through the hallway, you go downstairs, you have to make a turn, another hallway, you wind up in the kitchen and you look around and go, what the heck am I here for? Oh, I, there's dishes that need washing. I guess I'll do those. You know, somewhere then you remember, oh, I was going for scissors. Oh, right. <laughs> and you, you, you finally wind up back upstairs. But 
in that time, you know, you you dump your short-term memory every time you go through a doorway. And again, we can see that in ourselves as we, we, we see this when we forget things, the human condition. And when you think about why are we doing that, you know, why do our brains behave in this sort of odd fashion? And it has probably everything to do with our evolution. You know, if you move from the forest to the open prairie, you know, if you're out hunting for your your meal, um, your your focus has to shift immediately to exactly what is in front of you. What's here? Is there something that might be threatening me? Do I need to look out for something? Or is my meal showing up, <laughs> right? So you can see through evolution where you are depends on, and it really impacts what your focus is and what you need to pay attention to. And then it's easy to just start forgetting all the stuff that you thought of earlier. Well, we're no longer out generally hunting and gathering for our food, but you still see it when you move from one room to the other. If you go from inside your house to outside a house or a business, um, again, the, the focus shifts immediately. Instead of being in this cocooned environment, my safety of my house, I'm now outside and, and everything is here. Your focus changes and your attention changes. Um, yes. So Don't we recognize that yeah. so much. And by the way, I'd be, I'm going to jump in because oh, yeah. it, it also affects us on our computers. Every time a window opens, a pop-up window, and a shift of focus, a new tab opens, um, data entry fields pop up, you're dumping short-term memory. And if you've ever been in that situation where you say, oh, yep, I need to log this, this new ticket into my online system for my project, by the time you finally get that box open and they forced you to type in date, time, who you are, ticket title, by the time you get to the description, you're looking at that field going, I don't even remember what I was going to write <laughs> because my short-term memory got dumped with all of those windows popping up on me. I really love that observation that you particularly made about, you know, the other, the, the sort of like the, the, the web browser window it has the same thing. It's like going through a new doorway. It's like going in a new context. And obviously the kind of one of the more notorious examples of this sudden doorway is the locked doorway of the needing to enter a password. And it's, oh my God! At the time yes. you enter that, but you're like, "What am I? What did I log into this for again?" Um, and and this, then you can't find it, and then you're yeah. off on another rabbit hole trying to yeah. find the password. And heaven forbid, by the time you get back in, yeah. you've now forgotten why you were there. Yeah, yeah. and the and the and the fascinating thing about this is that again, like you know, this this a lot of this observation comes from psychology. It comes from management theory and things like mm -hmm. that. Uh, but then you can apply it in your daily life because what's the you know like you're. You know, it might be that like at your work, you've got a series of things to do, but in your life and at home, you've also got a series of things to do. And it might be sitting on a school board. It might be babysitting your grandchild or something like that. Mm -hmm. like, it mm -hmm. might be taking them to school or picking them up. And then you've got to like, where everybody has to work that stuff into their day. Um, maybe I've got a dinner later plan. Maybe I've got some preparation I need to do for something for something tomorrow. Um, you know, and, and that these, these really sophisticated practices and insights can actually be applied to your, your day-to-day -day life and just make you feel so much better. You can even like, and then your book is just full of examples like this. I don't know if this one's in there in particular, but like having your index card of what you're working on now in front of you, because you're mm -hmm. inevitably your cat brain or whatever is going to be doing this. But then you like looked out, oh, right, that's what I'm doing and, and get back to it. And then when you're done put, or like, pausing and having a place to put it and things like that can really help. And so it's one of the reasons I definitely recommend this book for anyone who's interested in sort of taking these, you might not be from the world of computer programming or management or, you know, manufacturing, but you can actually take these practices and, and change your daily life and productivity and improve the way you work with other people. Um, the last part of these interviews, uh, to segue once again, uh, that I always like to uh, do when I'm talking to a, a lean pub author is, um, could you talk a little bit about your process for writing this book? I know you've worked with other people, you got feedback and things like that, like you were just describing. So what was your pro uh, process for writing the book? Right, right. Um, I, thanks for asking. Um, I thought back on this and, you know, this book started um, somewhere back in 2017, where I had um, taken this practice that I had been using already by 2017. It had been about 10 years that I had been taking this basic approach to managing my 
personal and professional life and said, you know, I feel like I should share this with other people. I explained it to some and I had shown it to others and had gotten some good feedback. So I actually wrote out on what I thought was going to be a LinkedIn article. Now, at the time, I thought LinkedIn was a great place to begin to post these things. There wasn't Medium and you know some of these other uh, article publishing sites. And so I wrote it all up and I have shared it with one or two friends. And the feedback I had gotten was, oh, gosh, Helene, this is way too long for a LinkedIn article. Nobody will ever read that, right? The too long, didn't read <laughs> approach. Mm-hmm. So it's like, all right. So it kind of set um, for a little while. Um, but I started speaking on the process. I was at conferences, giving sessions and talks on it, going to meetup groups and local user groups, uh, local business meetings. And over time, I was refining it and refining the process. And um, I, I started to realize that there was something here that could, could help a lot of people. And it was in 2019, my business partner saw my process and suggested, you know, yeah, this is a great, a great thing that you're doing. You ought to write a book. <laughs> so I had something, the LinkedIn article that I had started with that was like way too short for a book and way too long for a, a, an article like that on online. Um, so that really started the book. So we, we decided at that point, okay, I started with that shell and there were pieces we knew we wanted to add to it. So we were adding sections on motivation. So it was off reading a few books like Dan Pink's Drive um, and, and a few other books on, on motivation and different motivators, kinesthetics. I did research on why this tactile approach really matters because I I just felt that having something physical in your hands spoke to something about us as humans, that that we've evolved. We've, We've really evolved in a world, a physical world. So our bodies and our brains are used to dealing with something physical. So I worked hard to find examples on that whole sense of touch and how that is so important. So we did research on that. We did research on some of the other topics of multitasking and the importance of ceremonies and the doorway effect, right? So we, from each bits of those, we were writing chapters. And it may have, and I think it took us a year-ish to write, to flesh the book out. Um, so we, we started with that. And at that point we had what we felt was a finished copy, um, on the book. We gave it to people to read. We had, um, various stages of reviewers, closer friends, people, you know, good close business associates. We would ask them to read and give us some early feedback on the book and we would get some feedback and we could incorporate it into it, um, we had next level stage of reviewers that might give us, again, we felt something a little more finished, get their feedback. So we went through a couple of phases of reviewers. Um, we did hire an editor to help help chunk out the text a little bit, um, give break things up even more um, into like nice section headings and smooth some of the text out and some of the examples out um, so that you know, we we did some of this all on our own to get what we felt was a, a good first pass at a book, um, and that was how we got started writing it. Uh, I, I can, you know, we we from there we were looking for publishers, and from there we met with a few publishers. You know, that we we had contacts with, and you know, there was interest, but never enough to to take it forward. Um, uh, a close business associate of ours um, who had written a book um, and successfully published uh, a couple of books introduced us to a literary agent that he had worked with. And so we we spent some time and we are still working with the literary agent as he has good relationships with a number of publishers um, to see if there's interest in getting that a true publishing house interested in the book. Um, but you know we after a year of working with, a literary agent and the publishing community really only wanting people that had already been published. Um, we we then made the the choice. Um, I'm hearing about Lean Pub through one of my business contacts who had published a book on your format, 
had suggested, why don't we look at Lean Pub? It was a great way to take what you have and follow that agile approach of let's get something out there for people to to see and interact with so we can get some feedback and you know continue modifying the book to make it even better. That's such a great story. And I, I really like the idea of, you know, the trying trying the sort of like the ideal situation first, which is you want a sort of proper publishing company to, to sort of take you up and invest in you and publish in you. And they're like, well, you know, if we've got someone else who's actually published before who can show a dem demonstrable history of sales and we've got you to choose between, you know, and then this is a classic situation, you know, like everyone from like, you know, if you want to be a, um, uh, you know, a server at a restaurant, they're like, what's your experience? Well, I don't have any, well, but we're not, no one will hire you. So you've got to sort of find your way in somehow. And it's one of the great things about that. And one of the things that makes what we do so fun is like that self-publishing and the way it's evolved over time means that people who otherwise would have just, you know, had nowhere to go uh, now do. And the they self-publishing is understand as, as what it is. I mean, one of the great, you know, sometimes we get to, authors who will apologize to us for taking their book off Lean Pub because they got picked up by a publishing company. And we're like, no, no, no. That's great. That's awesome. Uh, we, you know, we love it when people are sort of discovered on LeanPub, and then they, either that that book itself, or it helps the book that they published on LeanPub helps them get a book contract for their next one because they can say, "Hey, look, just all on my own. Look, I got look at the number of people that I reached and the sales that I got. Imagine what we could do if we worked together with your expertise in distribution and marketing and and stuff like that." So that's just that's just fantastic. Um, yeah. The and I wished you all the best with that project. Um, the 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 Thank last um, question that I always like to ask if the guest is a Lean Pub author is, um, while you were using Lean Pub, um, if there was one thing that had you uh, shaking your fist at the screen, going "Damn you, Lean Pub! Why is this broken? Why doesn't this work?" Or if there was one magical feature we could build for you, uh, what would you ask us to do? And I will ask you to bracket the fact that we sometimes have bugs with the creation of um, forums, which. We interacted about it. <laughs> Which you already, already know about, right? already <laughs> mentioned. So, uh, yeah, right. so, so anything else? Um, my, my, my one the, you know, piece of magic um, would be, and I'll, I'll share with you, well, I love the Lean Pub our, um, format and platform. There was a big learning curve that I felt that I needed to, to get through. Um, you have a lot of things documented which means there's a lot of documentation and there's a lot to read through. Um, and I think in some of the cases um, I read through, and I, I don't remember the specific topics, but there would be a topic of like, well, here you can choose between doing this or that and go over to here to the essay we've written on the this or that, and then you can decide which one you want to use. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> oh no. So another 30 minutes of reading or more to figure out what, what that is. So for me, I felt there was a learning curve I needed to like get through to uh, get to a point where I was comfortable. So that would be my one like wish of like, oh, can, it, can there just be like one place of like, here's here's like the the basics. Um, and I know you have some of that, but I still felt I followed the basics and I was still nervous about taking that first plunge because there were a lot of other, you can do this, you can do that, you can do here, you can do there. I wanted a little more hand holding. Yeah, thank you very much for for sharing that. That's really good for us to hear. I mean, because you know, as as you know, when you're close to something, you're always like you're always thinking about what else you could say about it, and you forget that not everybody wants to get a PhD in your product. Uh, you know, they just, <laughs> I know they want, and then and, and but like the very important thing that you said there, I think, was like you know, feeling feeling comfortable as you're going, not like you're going to make a mistake or whatever. Like just like follow these steps, and you'll get to this place in the journey, right? Yeah. And, and like from there. Turn around and review the, you know, the planes behind you that you can now see. Uh, but you know, continue then. Then you can continue climbing and, and reviewing as you go. But giving people a sense of like, okay, look, you're going to learn a lot. Book project is a big deal. If you once you have a book out, you've got maybe like maybe like years and years of opportunity to market it and get attention for it and for yourself and things like that. But like giving people, yeah, exactly as you say, kind of hand holding. Like it's like because like just look, look, get me. I need a guide through the first bit. I don't want to be making any decisions. I, I don't know your platform yet. How can I make a decision? Right. Just right. Get me, right. Get me to a certain, I want to get to a certain point, get me there. Then I'll think about all the complexity. 
and yeah. learn and learn about all these other things. And you guys are great. When you have questions as an author um, on LeanPub, when whenever I have questions, you guys are great at, at providing answers rather quickly. So you know, it, once I kind of realized, oh, I can, you know, I don't have to spend hours reading. There there are opportunities to get some questions answered. And you guys are, are great at, at like immediately making everything feel so comfortable and easy to do. So oh, well, thanks, thanks, so great much. support from from you guys. So thanks very much for that because it doesn't you know it doesn't always feel that way. That's good. It's oh good to hear no, it, it is. <laughs> and just on on that note, for any for anyone for anyone listening, you know the one of the things we we adopted this pro, this sort of like process later than we should have, uh, but one thing we realized was like we we do spend a, like a lot of time replying to emails or you know forum forum posts, like authors forum posts from authors and things like that. We realized that we had all these great answers to these great questions that were just living privately in one-on-one -on -one emails. So now whenever we have an interaction with an, an author or a reader, like with a customer of, of, of LeanPub, we actually try and like, if there isn't already a help center article about it, we transform that interaction into a help center article. Yeah. And that's why there's so many articles and like they're, uh, that it's always there so that like someone else who comes with that question and kind of hopefully type it into the help center and like get the answer that they're looking for. Um, but as you say, the problem is then you end up with like a thousand, literally a thousand awesome articles, or like, you know, but, but, but no connecting threads between them. Uh, and so we'll, we'll definitely take that uh, uh, feedback to heart and try and do more that way. Well, uh, Helene, uh, thank you very much for taking some time out of your day to talk to me and to talk to all of us. And thank you very much for using LeanPub as the platform for your book. We really appreciate it. You're welcome. And thank you guys for being there and being such, uh, have, providing such great support. Thanks.